Ah, shit. Hi. So, I watched a lot of movies in quarantine, or, you know, will be watching a few more movies in quarantine, because quarantine is technically still going on for me. So, I'll be watching a lot more movies. I was originally going to make this into one video, uh, but that would make this entire video feature length, so I decided I'd make it into parts. Uh, yeah, so that's pretty much it. I'm just going to be talking about a lot of movies I saw in quarantine. And just a word of warning, I'm not going to be looking into the camera that much because I find it very uncomfortable during the editing process. It's just... It's the way I am. I don't like looking at myself staring at me while editing a video, and all that I have to say is right here on the screen in front of me, so I'm just going to do that. And you can probably tell that I'm looking at the screen instead of the camera, and that is purposeful. I just got movies to talk about, so let's talk about movies. Uh, yeah, the first movie we're going to talk about is Casino by Martin Scorsese, a film that I saw with my dad. Uh, out of all the Scorsese films, uh, this one to me was probably the most overrated. The one thing that stood out to me as fantastic was the dynamic between Robert De Niro and Joe Pesci. I would go as far as to say that this film, out of all the films that I've seen from him, does the Pesci De Niro dynamic the best. The film managed to really dissect them to the bone where you at first see them as kind of similar people but then by the end of the movie you're like holy crap they are the opposite of each other. That is that's great. It's great writing. The performances are obviously fantastic and the movie has a very energetic soundtrack. The characters as a whole are very well written. I didn't find myself hating any character that, while well, hating them out of turn, I found myself hating the unlikable, purposefully unlikable characters, but I found myself loving, hating the purposefully unlikable characters. My biggest issue with the movie is that it's about three hours long without it really feeling it needed to be. This usually would not bother me because I like movies that are really long that have a reason for being that long. I mean, for God's sake, one of my favorite movies is Barry Lyndon, and that's like three hours long, and that's a fucking amazing movie. But for this movie, I feel as if the second act dragged on way too long. It almost felt as if the first and final act were a perfect 40 minutes, but the second act was like an hour and a half long when it really only needed to be maybe 50 minutes. There were parts that I legitimately loved, and there were parts where I kind of wondered why it wasn't shortened, uh, despite my gripes, I still believe this was a pretty great Martin Scorsese movie. I might check it out again in the future. Uh, I'll give it a 7 out of 10. Very solid movie. I also watched Richard Linklater's The Before Trilogy with my mother. It's kind of hard to talk about each film individually, so I'll just talk about the entire trilogy as a whole. What I really loved about it is just how real the characters felt. The performances by Julie Delphi and Ethan Hawke were certainly fantastic. The scripts were also surprisingly fantastic. I always felt as if the dialogue was natural and not written by a computer like many other romantic films today, romantic comedy films today. They were all well shot. The second one especially used long takes in a fantastic way where the camera would just linger as the two characters would walk through the city and just talk. And it was just very impressive to me how the performances held and how I never felt my immersion break during these scenes. There are decisions that characters make that don't always make sense to me, but they never felt out of place for their character. I also believe that making a great love story, especially one that I like, is a difficult task, so this trilogy was definitely a pleasant surprise. I love the characters and the actual filmmaking, so I would give the trilogy a 7.5. Next is The Platform, a Spanish sci-fi thriller thing that kind of released out of nowhere onto Netflix. It takes place in a prison that has a descending platter of food that the top levels get first and the bottom levels obviously get last. Just from that, you can probably get the gist of the plot, so I won't go into any detail there. It's one of those movies that tries to be some sort of commentary similar to Snowpiercer, but where that movie succeeded with is in characters, intensity, and it had a ton of personality, and I love the sequence of events and the and just the writing in general. It was a, the Snowpiercer was a great movie, but this movie had none of that. It had some interesting shots, kind of, and some fun gore kills that were satisfying for like 10 seconds, but there was no emotion or consequence behind it, and the film as a whole was just incredibly uninvesting. The ending also sucked, but it fit in with just how bad the rest of the movie was, so I can't see complaining about the ending feeling all that worth it, so I'm not even gonna do that. 
It was just a boring, forgettable mess that I wouldn't recommend, so I'm giving this a four. Next is The Banishment, a family drama by Russian director Andrei Zvyadkinsev. I'm not entirely sure I'm pronouncing that right, but I'm just going to move on. Every single one of this director's films that I've seen are incredibly impressive. My favorite film from him is Loveless, but I would start with Leviathan if you're planning on checking this guy out. The Return is his first film, but I have not seen that yet. This film, The Banishment, has a reputation of being the worst of his films, but I'm not exactly on board with that. Compared to his other films, I will admit the story is one of the weaker ones, but in terms of presentation and filmmaking, this is still pretty masterful, especially when compared to his other films. Just like his other films, the cinematography is absolutely amazing, his use of static shots is delicious eye candy, I love the long takes and the wide shots. The score is also fantastic, and you can probably tell by the background music that it's very hypnotic of sorts. He's also a very patient director that only reveals things in the story when absolutely necessary. The performances are also phenomenal. Compared to his other films, the story is weaker than the others, but it's still an incredibly well-crafted film. I wouldn't start with this movie if you're planning on checking out this director, and if you're not familiar with this director's style, definitely check out Leviathan. Or if you're not used to slow movies in general, then definitely don't check out this one first. It is very slow. I still think this was a great movie despite my issues with the story, and I'll give it an 8 out of 10. Next is the Tiger King miniseries that everybody has probably seen by now. This is one of those documentaries that solely survives on its subject and characters. In the grand scheme of things, the documentary isn't presented in any unique or purposeful way. But honestly, that doesn't bother me because the focus of this documentary is twisted as fuck. The different people they interview are incredibly eccentric and sometimes downright cartoony. But you continue to watch it because it's absolutely fascinating that people like this exist. It's very funny and it's never boring at all. The way this doc reveals information only adds to the murkiness of the story. I'll keep this short because chances are you've already seen this, so I'll just say that everyone involved is fucking insane and nobody here is good or bad because they're all crazy people i'm just glad that i have nothing to do with any of them i'll give this documentary a 7 maybe a 7.5 i'm not really sure i'll just stick with a 7 i've only seen it once so that rating might change i'm not entirely sure so i'll just stick with a 7 on this one next up is fear and desire one of the films that acclaimed director stanley kubrick made in fact i think it's his first movie this definitely will not come as any surprise to anyone. I love Stanley Kubrick and pretty much all of his films. My three favorites, as I mentioned earlier, or at least one of them, is Barry Lyndon, 2001, and Full Metal Jacket. Those are my three favorites, and uh, there isn't really any movie that I would call from him legitimately bad, is what I would have said about a week ago. And then I saw this movie, and I'm like, wow, this movie is actually legitimately bad. <laughs> Whoops. It tries to be a study into the behavior of soldiers in a desperate situation, but it's very by the numbers and stale, which is kind of the opposite of what Stanley Kubrick later became. I do like that it presents the behavior of the soldiers in a way where it doesn't take any sides, it's not saying these are the good guys and these are the bad guys, it's saying, well, th these are just how they act, and I like that, I like how it doesn't make me choose a side. But the good of this film is nearly wiped out by the bad, like the bad performances and the lackluster cinematography. I'm actually forgetting about things to say about this as I'm talking about it, and right here I didn't even write much because there just wasn't much to talk about, so I don't even know why I'm talking about it in this video. Anyway, it doesn't matter. I'm giving it a 4 out of 10, just avoid it. Next is Son of Saul, an absolutely fantastic Holocaust movie that may have surpassed The Pianist as my favorite Holocaust movie. Like most Holocaust movies, it's very emotional and bleak. This is a story about a Jewish man who is forced to burn the corpses of his own people and shovel their ashes into a river. That alone makes this film particularly depressing slash brutal compared to the other Holocaust films that I've seen. The presentation of this film is so impressive that it's hard to talk about it without seeing it first. The cinematography is presented in a way where it almost only focuses on the main character, so every action committed by other characters are in the background and feel more natural to the film's universe. 
The fact that the violence is being committed around the main character and not being focused on makes it feel much more real and all the more disturbing. There are tons of impressive long takes that give off a strong sense of claustrophobia that I sometimes feel is missing from other Holocaust movies. The uses of depth of field were also very purposeful, which is rare in film today. There's actually a lot of action in the film, and the fact that this is a debut feature makes that even more impressive. The tone and atmosphere are also very purposeful, with masterful sound design giving real presence to the film. There are so very few movies that give off such an emotionally visceral and gripping experience that I actually feel obligated to recommend it when I find one. Again, as a debut feature, the director was taking a huge risk with this style of presentation, and for me, the payoff was incredibly satisfying. Even more impressively, this film took the Grand Jury Prize at Cannes back in 2015 and even won Best Foreign Film at the Oscars in 2016. This might not be for everyone, but I would feel like I cheated you if I didn't give it a glowing recommendation. I cannot wait to own this on Blu-ray, and I'll just move on and say that this is a 9.5 out of 10 movie. I also rewatched 1917, the newest Sam Mendes film. When I first saw this in theaters, I thought it was enjoyable, but definitely not amazing. The fact that it was presented as if it were filmed all in one shot makes some scenes intense and gripping, whereas in others it felt pointless. Sadly, there are only three sequences in particular that I really enjoyed, whereas the rest of the film ranges from distracting to boring. The one-shot aspect isn't really all that impressive because there were tons of cuts noticeable everywhere. There were obvious pans over rocks and behind trees. Another cut was poorly masked with an explosion. This definitely didn't break the film, but it made it very difficult to appreciate the one-shot aspect to it. There's even a scene where they just cut to black in the middle of the movie. It was done inside a building, so they could have done something like maybe a maybe like some sort of time-lapse shot out of Birdman, or maybe a, a, just a simple lighting change, just to keep the pace flowing. The movie did have great cinematography and framing, and the long takes where there weren't any cuts were very impressive and certainly fun to watch. The writing felt very cheesy, and I couldn't get invested in the characters. The performances are just kind of decent. The use of music is honestly really bad. There were a bunch of cheesy build-up cues that you'd hear out of a shitty awards ceremony. It was overall kind of a bland, soulless movie with great shots and admittedly fantastic production design. Especially to someone who actually studies history. But again, as a film, it had nothing new or purposeful to add, so I just wound up feeling bored through it. It also reminded me a lot of better movies as I was watching it. There were points where I wished I was watching Children of Men or Son of Saul. The river scene made me wish I was watching The Revenant. There's also a pretty fantastic documentary out there called They Shall Not Grow Old, which I was constantly reminded of while watching this. I know that some people love this movie, and I really, really wanted to love it, but I just couldn't get into it. So I'm just gonna give it a 5.5. I watched The White Ribbon by Michelle Hanukkah, one of my favorite directors. Again, I'm not entirely sure I'm pronouncing his name right but I'll just move on. I haven't seen all of his films, but the one word that comes to mind whenever I think of him is expert. Every aspect of any of his films is meticulously crafted to the most minute detail. In this case, this film legitimately has no mistakes. I've looked it up. I've actually looked into it. There are literally no mistakes in the entire movie. The one goof that they say is on IMDb is actually not a goof at all. And there's only one and it's not a goof. So he legitimately made the perfect movie. So for me, it would only boil down to personal taste. This movie takes place in a German town just before World War I, almost as if it's hinting at the kind of people that children will become. For a movie that has a large number of child actors, they're all amazing. Not a single performance was distracting in any way. The cinematography is also amazing. The use of long takes is fantastic, and with the black and white color palette involved, it makes so many shots beautiful eye candy. Its lax use of a score also elevates the tension to a whole new level, which is something that he usually does in his movies. I'm not gonna say anything about the story because it's worth experiencing without anything revealed. It's also got fantastic production design and costumes. If you want to see a masterful piece of art, then check this out. This also won't be the last Hanukkah movie that I review in quarantine because I saw another one. This movie, however, gets a nine. Okay, we're getting close to the end now. Another movie I watched was Nosferatu, the famous, uh, the famous silent film. 
Uh, this is sadly a movie that I couldn't really get into. It had cheesy music and it kind of felt like a product of the time. I know that might be the reason why some people really love it, and I really have no doubt as to how this film was incredibly influential, especially at the time. But unlike another silent film called Metropolis, which was twice as long, I was bored watching this movie. The only thing I liked was the production design and the performance by Max Schreck, but uh, the rest of the film just kind of left no impression. I really don't have much to say, so I'll just give it a 5. And the final movie I'll talk about today, or technically tonight, is The Death of Stalin by Armando Iannucci. This film is a political satire covering the events after Stalin's death. What really made this film work for me was how well it captured the clusterfuck that Russia became after Stalin's death watching the characters scramble for power, while simultaneously not being very smart themselves leads to very hilarious scenes. The performances are all great and I love the choice to have the actors not even try to imitate a Russian accent at all. I love the script and I never felt bored with the dialogue. As a history man, it's also a great recount of the events leading up to the election of the new leader of Russia. There are multiple things in the story that you could swear aren't true and never happened but turned out to be very true and did happen. As a whole, the film is legitimately well made with great production design and music. I wish the cinematography and lighting were a bit more dynamic because quite a few scenes felt as if they were something out of a TBS comedy rather than an actual film. Despite this, it was still very hilarious and I very much enjoyed it as not only a political satire, but a historical recount of the events. And I'd recommend it to anybody. It's very accessible. I would give it a seven out of 10. Okay, that's gonna be it for now. Uh, I do have more of these videos planned, and, um, I'm just gonna talk about more of the movies that I saw in quarantine, so keep a lookout for those. If you want to keep up to date on all the movies that I watch, even the ones that I don't even talk about, then, uh, probably follow my Letterboxd account, which I will leave in the description below. There's a lot of cool stuff down there. That's gonna be it. Thank you very much for tuning in, and take care of yourself. Be smart, be safe, be healthy. See you next time.